friends, hi, my name is Mia and this is my virtual vanity, a place where we both love makeup and we're quite critical of it. Welcome to another art inspired shop my stash video where I do a makeup look inspired by a piece of artwork that caught my fancy. I either do a look based on what the subject of the painting seems to be wearing or on what the colors and textures of the painting suggests to me. Usually I start this video with the shop my stash part of it, but this month something special happened to me. A brand sent a product for me for the very first time. Before we start the video, I want to talk to you guys a bit about Ana Luisa Jewelry, which sent me these beautiful pieces of jewelry. Um, they let me pick what I wanted, and I picked these three items for practical reasons and a very frivolous reason too. The earrings I picked because I like understated jewelry in my day-to-day -day life. I like fancy big-ass earrings when I'm wearing a simpler outfit, but for day-to-day -day work, I like smaller pieces. And I feel that these are quite beautiful and striking without overpowering wearing the jewelry and it's not the jewelry wearing me. I also picked their rope bold ring for no other reason than because it looked like a croissant and that tickled my fans. A bit about Ana Luisa jewelry, they provide long lasting, quality pieces at affordable prices, $39 and upwards. They're tarnish free, they use luxury metals, and what I really like about them is that they're trying to negate their carbon footprint. They're also really trying to think about the environment. They're aiming to zero net carbon footprint by the end of 2020, which I think is a really admirable goal and more companies should do that. If you're interested in any of their stuff, I have a code with them. You can use me as virtual vanity 10 for 10% off. Okay, without further ado, we spoke about the shiny. Let's put some shiny on our faces. Cue the shop my stash montage. Hi everyone and welcome to the shop my stash part of this video. Today we are going to talk about the painting called Starlight by Emile Vernon. And I was in two minds about it. I could have gone with a look inspired by what her face looks like. So a very coral cheeks, very coral lips and a darker eye look. Something subtle but smoky. But I realized that that would be the easiest way out. So instead I chose products that would help me create a look inspired by the way she is dressed, by that gauzy, translucent fabric and the yellow blanket or toga that she seems to have on her. For base, I'm going to start with the Gerovita Lux Luxury Wrinkle Reducing Cream with SPF 15. I got this as a sample when I last went to the grocery store and I'm looking to finish this up because it's not impressing me much. It's fine, but... It, it is really mediocre and that might be because I am not the target audience for it. I still have quite young skin, so maybe I'm not seeing the effects that it says it should have. Up next is the Sika Pear Derma Green Solution Dr. Jart and this is the Tiger Grass Color Correcting Treatment. I use this as a lightweight foundation when it's too hot at sight for real foundation or in the winter when I'm simply not in the mood to put a full face on. I really like this, this is very light, this just sinks right into the skin, doesn't look like makeup at all all. I've been a bit of an insomniac in the last couple of weeks, I've not been able to sleep well, so I will need all of the help I can get to counteract my dark circles. Here comes the Becca Under Eye Peach Corrector and this is the, in the light to medium variant. As you can see this has got quite a dip in it, it it's got some love, it's got a crater. For concealer, I'm going to use my beloved Catrice Liquid Camouflage, my favorite concealer of life. I've lost count of how many of these I've actually bought. I really like this because it's very high coverage without being heavy or cakey. It's not too liquidy, not too thick. It's in the Goldilocks region for what I like in a concealer.
For powder, I'm going to use the Zessie British Museum powder and this is in light ivory, I think. I'm still testing this out, so I'm going to use this look as a lab rat to continue seeing how this performs on me. I already know I don't like it under the eyes, but I'm still not sure about how I feel about it all over my face, so we'll figure that out in this video. I'm trying to grow my brows out, I'm calling it the Were Werewolf Eyebrow Project. So I'm not going to do much to them, I'm just going to use the Essence Make Me Brow, which is a classic, um, something else that I've lost count how many of these I bought. And she doesn't seem to have much going on in her brows anyway, they seem quite thin, quite vintage looking, well excuse you. Mascara, I'm going to use the L'Oreal Volume Million Lashes in the variant Excess. This is a mediocre mascara. It doesn't curl that much. It does lengthen. It does volumize, but the volume comes at a high price of your lashes clumping up. So I'm very keen to use this for the next two or so months until I have to toss it out and just buy a new one. On to more interesting things. For blush, I'm going to use this Douglas blush and this is in E314. I always forget I have this in my collection and always say, oh, I should declutter it. And then I use it and I love it and I use it for the next week or so and then forget about it again. It's just a cyclical type of cycle with it. This is a very beautiful peachy, warm coral blush that just goes a bit pink. You'll see it on the cheeks. I really do enjoy it. I just need to use it more. For highlighter, I'm going to go with something very gold and this is the Mani MUA Lunar Beauty Highlighter in Mercury. The packaging is stunning, the color is beautiful, very strong swatched, but you can sheer it out on the cheeks to be quite, I wouldn't say subtle, but not in your face either. It's very versatile in that kind of way. And I feel that this will call out to the gold tones that I will be using on my eyes as well as her yellow golden toga that she has in the painting. Let's start talking about the eye look and the base for this eye look will be Neve Cosmetics Unicorno which is a beautiful golden to subtle green shift. I really like this shade. It's it's just beautiful for when you want something that's not in your face, but still special. To add a bit more spice, I'm going to use the Neve Cosmetics Oxygeno single. And combined with the gold, I feel that it will call out to that teal sort of gauzy fabric that she has going on. I know I keep using this non-stop, but it's literally the only baby blue single that I have in my collection. So yeah, I will keep using this to death. Sorry, not sorry. Let's talk a bit about her toga. She has a very strong yellow fabric going on, right? And I do feel that while Neve Unicorn is beautiful, it doesn't quite have the punch needed. So I will be using this Pat McBrath mini palette, particularly this golden shade, because it is quite pigmented, quite strong, and it has that cold gold undertone that I'm looking for. To bring the effect of translucency that that fabric had, I'm going to use the Kaleidos highlighter in Skywalker, which is a very beautiful shimmery blue highlighter with a transparent base and blue teal sparkle. I am really keen to see how the look will come out and I'm really excited to create Let's get started. Today I want to talk about how the aesthetics and expectations of female beauty changed in European art across time. I'm limiting myself to European art because that is what I'm most familiar with. I'm going to start by moisturizing my skin really well. Just like in art, if you prep your skin, if you prep your canvas, makeup will apply much better. And I'm also going underneath my eyes to make sure that area is really moisturized because my sleeping schedule has gone to shit and I've not had a proper uninterrupted eight hours sleep in um, weeks. So we're looking a bit haggard. I think everyone knows the very famous statuette of Venus of Willendorf. That 
has been dated to circa 20,000 years ago, which sets it in prehistoric times. And historians suppose that it was part of certain fertility rites and that it depicted the ideal, most fertile peak female body at the time. As you can see, she is quite curvaceous, dummy thick, if you would. And I would assume that in those times, aesthetics weren't as prized as survival and what such a body meant. Such a curvaceous body meant abundance, security, safety, because that meant you were not burning calories, running after your food and running from like saber-toothed tigers or whatever little beasties were roaming around. From that time onwards, I, our perception of bodies changed. I feel that we can look at the female body in two ways as it is interpreted, either by what it means, the aesthetics of it, and sometimes what it means can be quite strange because we tend to attribute certain behaviors and moralities to the bodies we see around us. Um, we see a lot of harmful imagery and opinions of um, voluptuous bodies being seen as lazy in current capitalist society or lacking willpower, while very thin bodies in the past were seen as sick, sickly, um, underkempt, uh, not a good sign, whereas in today's perception of female beauty aesthetics, they are seen as the ideal because they signify a certain type of willpower somehow. Of course, these perceptions are not objective. The perceptions that we have of our female beauty and female bodies will always change according to society and the current aesthetics and socio-economical factors in society. At the time, the people that created that Venus statue honestly had to worry about survival. They did not have this whole complicated capitalist system or the internet where they could pick apart at each other. They would look at a voluptuous woman and think that woman is doing well for herself. She has stuff to eat, which means she is able to have healthy chubby babies when the time comes. Adding a green color corrector to nullify a bit of the redness in my face and in places where my pores are bigger such as my nose I'm not only swiping I'm also patting and rubbing in to make sure that the product does not sit on top of my skin. After that I'm following with a bit of the Becca under eye corrector concealer and ending with my base makeup. As civilization started progressing, people started to be less worried about survival and thus what bodies meant for survival and started being more preoccupied with aesthetics and proportions. In ancient Greece and ancient Rome, the ideal female body was proportionate, symmetrical, perfectly molded according to um, height, osseture. You can see this desire for proportionate symmetrical beauty in their statues, in their artwork, but especially in the statues where it was very important for them to get everything fitting quite right. So we now see people wanting the body to strike balance. They want it to be pleasantly plump. They want it to be vigorous, vivacious, not showcasing one extreme or the other. Uh, they don't want very thin, ascetic type of bodies. They don't want very voluptuous bodies either. They want someone that is perfectly average, but average in a very classical, beautiful type of way. And we can see that even as far as the Renaissance and with Leonardo da Vinci's Vitruvian Man, again, this obsession with perfectly proportionate people, most of the time, perfect proportions do not exist in real life. So there is always that gap between what mother nature did when creating us versus what the ideal proportions of the time are. Uh, because that is a very important point to hit as well, that ideal female body proportions change with the time. What we would consider average 
was at the time the ideal proportionate woman nowadays as someone that is excessively curvy in all of the right place places but also excessively thin in all of the right places that is considered proportionate and aesthetic but if you sent a Kim K for example in the Renaissance or in antiquity she would seem very deformed and disproportionate even though in today's times she is the peak of a certain type of beauty that people seek to attain back then she wouldn't have been the ideal at all I'm going to apply my powder and this is the Zesty British Museum powder I don't like it under the eyes but applying it now it looks very fine and very smoothing on the face so I think this is more of a like all over face powder rather than a setting under eye powder something interesting that happened in the early middle ages up to the dark ages and exiting the middle ages was the effect that Christianity did to how people were portrayed in art and how people created art so for a while religious art was all the rage and if you wanted to not starve as an artist you would paint religious subjects there were two types of religious paintings there were the religious paintings that were very androgynous so you would maybe identify people their gender by their clothing and not by the shape of their body so there was this onset of having a focus more on the spiritual than the physical and the inner qualities that made you a good Christian as opposed to your mortal coil that you would shuffle out of at death. And then there were the religious paintings that were of a more intricate realistic style where again people were very proportionate. What happened though was that for certain painters the women were very voluptuous or they were not looking very stereotypically womanish so to say of course no woman's body is the same but they looked suspiciously like someone copy pasted boobs on the body of a man these painters were men and they wouldn't have access to female models so what they did was they used other men as models or themselves and they didn't manage to um, adapt the anatomy to look natural uh, nowadays with our extensive knowledge of human anatomy and our extensive um, art resources online books whatever we know how to kind of transform a female body into a male body or a male body into a female one when being posed but back then the art resources that you had was learning from other people and learning from models you did not have proper models you would do dumb mistakes and the best example of this is like ugly renaissance animals and ugly renaissance babies oh yeah those are kind of staring into your soul but that's the cause they did not have from life models to adapt into a painting and that brings me to a very interesting point and that is that for many many thousands of years in Europe art and thus the perception of the body of the female body idealized through art was very male gaze centric very white centric as well because most Europeans at the time were lily white except for uh, the Roman Empire and the Greeks so being male-centric, I don't think we have that many artistic sources of how women saw themselves at the time. We see that a bit later, for example, with paintings from Miss Gentileschi, and you clearly see a difference in how natural and lifelike her women look, um, as opposed to how women were painted by men. I'm going to start working on the eye look and what I'm going to do is the following. I'm going to apply a wash of Unicorno all over the lid up into the crease and really high because I don't have that much lid space and I'm doing this with a very fluffy brush. I am then going to grab a tinier more precise brush and I'm going to place Oxygeno right in the crease and the outer V. I like layering shimmers like this because it makes for a very 
magical, unusual type of look, very multi-layered. And you can see that at a certain point, I am keeping the brush from the end of the handle. That helps with having a uh, smoother, more transparent application of product. So if I don't want huge punch of pigmentation, that's the technique that I would use. And if you want something more pigmented, then you grab it by the start of the handle near the ferrule. I'm going then to add the Pat McGrath Gold in the outer V and Kaleidos Skywalker Highlighter in the center of the lid and just in the center of the lid because I wanted to catch light and not overpower what else I did with the look. In Victorian England and with the Industrial Revolution, the 19th century, we see a rapid shift in the aesthetics of female beauty and the ideal body. In Victorian England, the onus was on a very small waist, a busty, curvy figure, and that was helped with, and that was created with the help of corsets, padding, um, undergarments that would make the skirt fluffier to create that type of contrast. And in the following decades, from the 19th century on, we kind of start seeing a seesaw, a zigzag type, zigzag type of pattern in what people consider to be beautiful. So 1910s, you had these very voluptuous figures, but very, a very thin wasp-like waist. In the 1920s, the roaring 20s, you start seeing more androgynous dress figures that looked best on waif-like silhouettes, small chests small um, derriere, uh, you would not say that they had, you know, the fatty, the ass, but they would have legs for days. That was the ideal in that time and it was, I think, dictated a bit by the fashions of the time. 1930s and 1950s, we go back to the hourglass figure, to that ideal of proportionate femininity but without the exaggerated waist of the 1910s. 1960s, again, tall, waifish figures, that hippie aesthetic, very tall, very thin, long-limbed, fairy-like, I would say, followed in the 1980s by strength. And that is a very interesting type of aesthetic because in the 1980s, that ideal to be fit, but also acceptably fit. So there were, again, these constraints where you could not be too much of that or too much of this. You could not have very prominent bicep or very prominent thighs or six pack abs, you know, or like a, a, a stronger, thicker midsection. You had to look acceptably fit, toned. And sometimes strength, real strength, real functional strength, that is, does not come necessarily with that type of aesthetic. Um, you can attain that type of fit toned aesthetic that was particular of the 80s and is sometimes still very wanted even in the 2020s by being thin, low body fat, developed muscles but not too much, not too much. No matter what decade you look to, there are these constraints of ideal female beauty that are not possible unless the person is either naturally genetically inclined towards a certain body type or if they in invest like a lot of time and effort into it for example if i were born in the 1920s no matter how much weight i would have lost i would have not made the ideal body of the time and so there is always this finish line that 99 percent of women can't reach it's just the moment you start to actually actively pursue a sport or a more relaxed lifestyle and start accepting yourself for for who you are you divert yourself from the ideal and it's so my conspiracy theory allegedly maybe it has not been intentional but the female ideal in any century has been unattainable for 90 percent of women and people have capitalized on that immensely and speaking of unattainable the 2000s have been especially bad from unrealistically thin bottles in the early 2000s and even now in 2020, uh, starting 2010 even, with 
figures promoted by various celebrities that cannot naturally be attained unless you are part of that genetically gifted 1% or have like a lot of plastic surgery. So my point is no matter the time or the decade it seems that beauty standards and the ideal female body are always shifting almost always unattainable unless you are lucky to be genetically inclined to the mold that that current decade or century seeks as the ideal then i don't think we're ever going to be happy with how we look I think that all of the parts of society tell us that we should not be happy with how we look and that we should always be striving towards this ideal, but the goalpost at the finish line always keeps moving. I think what's the best thing to do is that we should all strive to be the best version of ourselves if we have the energy for that and accept and take care of our bodies to the best of our ability. Best is just aesthetics, aesthetics change and aesthetics will always be used against you as a measuring tape to make you feel lesser than. I think I'm done. I've been very preachy, I think, but I hope this video was a bit useful in shedding light in how fast beauty changes, especially the ideal of female beauty. This is the final look. Thank you guys so, so much for watching. Please let me know your opinions down in the comments. And if you do go and shop on Ana Luisa, don't forget to use my code Mia's Virtual Vanity 10. I'm also going to have it in the description box and in a comment pinned down below. Thank you guys so so much for watching. Have a wonderful evening, morning, second breakfast, third lunch, whatever it is where you're from. Bye!